Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, on this blessed Sunday, make us worthy to praise your resurrection with pure hearts and clear consciences. With all the children of your Holy Church, we glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. raise glory, honor, and praise to the good and merciful Lord, who in his compassion came down to us and became flesh. He chose to taste death to save us, and he descended to the realm of the dead. By his resurrection he gave joy to his disciples and gave light to all the nations with the light of his salvation. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. O oh, word of God, who can adequately praise you for the depth of your compassion? And what voice can bless you, for you are above all praise? Neither mind nor tongue can describe the wonders you accomplished on Sunday, the day of your resurrection from the dead. And so with the psalmist David we cry out, This is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice in it and be glad. Now, O Christ our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense which we offer you, to forgive our sins, give peace of mind to those in distress, and comfort to those who are anxious. Bring back those who are far and watch over those who are near. Guide the shepherds, sanctify the priests, purify the deacons, pardon all sinners and guard the righteous, protect orphans and help widows, drive away all conflicts and put an end to all dissension. Remember the faithful departed and grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom, that with them we may celebrate that eternal feast. We raise glory to you and to your blessed Father and to your living Holy Spirit forever.
O Lord, accept the sweet fragrance of our incense and make us worthy to announce your resurrection with the angels, to proclaim it with your women disciples and to rejoice in it with your pure apostles. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Kaddishat. with joy from the mountains. Sunday is a feast so great. Offer praise to the Lord God and with angels celebrate. Reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Barak Morobo. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, as a body is one, though it has many parts, and all parts of the body, though many, are one body so also is Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and were all given to drink of one spirit. Now, you are Christ's body and individually parts of it. Some people, God has designated to, in the church to be first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then mighty deeds, then gifts of healing, assistance, administration, and varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all do mighty deeds? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? interpret? Strive eagerly for the greatest spiritual gifts. Praise be to God always.
Let's the praise, glory, and honor of the Most Holy Trinity of our listening sense. Kyrie Eleison. Before the proclamation of the Gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaim life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, the listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you, listening in glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Lord Jesus says, Behold, I am sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves. But beware of men, for they shall hand you over to courts, and they shall scourge you in their synagogues, and they shall, you shall be led before governors and kings for my sake, as a witness before them and before the pagans. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. You shall be given at that moment what you are to say. For it shall not be you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brothers shall hand over brother to death, and the father his child. Children shall rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you shall be hated by all because of my name. But whosoever endures to the end shall be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to another. Amen, I say to you, you shall not finish the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. No disciple is above his master, and no slave above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, and for the slave to become like his master. And if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, then how much more those of his household? This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, forgiving us his words of life. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. Behold, I send you as lambs among wolves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. From the readings that we have this week, because of course throughout the season of Pentecost, as you realize, we do the exact same liturgical readings, week A, week B, back and forth. But because of the readings scripturally this week, we'll say that this is a Sunday of profound mysticism. In our readings in the Safra this morning, in the morning office, we read from the first letter of St. John. And John speaks about the clash that there is between the world and the disciples. Same thing that our Lord is speaking of in the Gospel. But what St. John talks about is this, he uses the term antichrist. It's one of these where we get these terms. This opposition to Christ, this antichrist spirit in the world and he says, therefore, you also receive that backlash. 
But he says that the one who is within you, the Christ, God, the one who is within you is greater than that which is without. So continue with courage and to understand that with that presence within you, you will necessarily be victorious. Perhaps not according to the judgment of the world, but you will be definitively victorious. And that's what our Lord, when we see this gospel today, it's, it's not very attractive, we could say. Who wants to be scourged in the synagogues? Who wants to be dragged before courts? Who wants to be imprisoned? Who wants the phrase that when our Lord says that everyone will hate you because of my name? All our Lord is doing here is that the reality of truth which enters by the Messiah into the world is a reality then which continues by extension throughout the generations, both by baptism for the disciples and through the sacrament of the priesthood, this reality continues. <clears throat> and he basically tells them because of the same reason they rejected me, they'll also reject you. It doesn't mean that every moment of our lives someone's trying to kill us, of course. But it does indicate the profound misunderstanding and ignorance of those Catholics who whine and wring their hands saying, well, why do we have to teach this? Why do we have to teach that? Why can't that be changed? Why do we? Because the reality of the Messiah is the reality of the Messiah. These teachings, this doctrine didn't start yesterday. It didn't start last century. It begins with Christ. And we know the story. We know that when the Messiah entered into the world, the very people who were meant to receive him rose up against him and had him put to death. And so our Lord just simply says, they've rejected me beforehand. He tells them at the Last Supper, if you recall, they will hate you. But you must remember, but they hated me first and they will hate you for the same reason. Now, obviously, if we're a jerk and they don't like us, well, that's a different problem. But that's not what our Lord is talking about here. They will hate you for my sake, because of my name, because of what you are. So that's why we speak about it as being a, a readings of mysticism, because our Lord is talking about the oneness of who we are with the reality of the Christ which is why the reading is to the Corinthians that we have in the beginning about the church as one body, one Christ. Everyone has different functions. Some are prophets, some are teachers, some are apostles, etc. He goes through a list. But everyone is a viable and valuable member to the body of Christ because there's only one Christ. It's why we refer to the church as being the body of Christ. And this is why in the great importance, you know, we have this, we've, we've considered this over the months, the people who will be off mountain, you know, climbing Katahdin today, because this is where they find God. And we've talked about the distinction. Why do we have the mysteries? Why are we at church on Sunday? What do we do on a weekly basis? And why are we here? And we mentioned it's the whole distinction between what God is. That God is everywhere. He's the creator. If God wasn't present to something, it wouldn't exist, philosophically speaking. But to know that God exists or to know something about the origin of all things is not the same thing as to know who he is. We gave the example. You know, you can have the woman who lives two doors, three doors, four doors down the street from you in the neighborhood. You know what she is, she's a human being. You know something about her, you know the street she lives on, you know that she's there. On occasion you've said hi, and she seems to be pleasant, but that's all you know. You know that she lives there, and you know what, something about her. But if this woman all of a sudden becomes engaged in your neighborhood, and now she starts chairing the committee for the block organization, and she joins the PTA and she starts being present and she starts and she stops when you're working in the yard and she talks to you. All of a sudden, what you knew down the street now becomes something different because now you know who she is and she may become friend because you like what you find and who that is. You can climb Katahdin until your last day 
and you will never discover on that rock who God is. What God is, yeah, I can stand. The other day I was looking out, and if you don't see the factory, the Kennebec is quite beautiful with the trees on the other side and the park and winds low. It's quite lovely. And that tells me a lot about the Creator, but it's in the divine mysteries where God, each week and day after day in our prayers, God works to reveal who He is. And that's all the difference in the world. That's why that each day, each week, this day of the resurrection, we're here. Because the who-ness is what allows us to become in that mystic union with that one Christ. By baptism, by the sacred mystery, we're made a member. And of course, for most of us, many of us, most of us, we're baptized as babies, so we're not even aware of it. And our parents, when we are children, are meant to be drawing us in to discover who Jesus is. And discovering that is that you're introducing him to a friend that is yours. And that friend is meant to become their intimate friend as they become into adulthood and adolescence. That's supposed to be the logical pursuit. Someone who loves before introduces you to another friend that we love. And then when your children are adults and they start going off into their world on their own, they will love that one who has revealed himself to them personally and not just because mom or dad said so. These are hard truths because, of course, our Lord says, I send you out into the world like lambs among wolves. Wolves eat lambs, we know that. That's the image, they eat. They chase you down. They paw your back, break your back, rip your throat, eat you. And our Lord means to have that image. And it's not something that we can actually embrace if we don't know who it is that we love and who it is that we are made one in. So that's why I say this reality when our Lord is talking about because of my name, not just because of you. And it's an important thing to realize because in this day and age, we know the world that we have around us is different from when I and when you were children. It doesn't have the same structure. The young people don't have a neighborhood that they can be in anymore. Some of them don't even have families that they can be in anymore. And this is tragic. The whole reason for calling the church the body of Christ is that there is an entire network of a living, vital reality by grace. It's what we say when we, we say in the Apostles' Creed that we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. We believe in that divine reality which we call the church, but we also believe in the life which is part of those in grace that we call the communion of saints. And because the world has changed, we were having a conversation with someone that earlier this week, and they said, Father, you need to walk around in the streets. I guess like with a sandwich board saying, you know, eat at St. Joseph's. You know, go. As if people would come up and talk to a priest in 2019. Now in 1988, when I was ordained, people did. And for years, I'd be in airports. People would come across an airport. Some of them would go to confession. They'd come by and they'd say, excuse me, Father, I'm sorry, but can I, can I, sit, can I ask you a question? I had people on international flights changing their seats, coming up and saying, excuse me, Father, I noticed that there's a seat empty in the days when, you know, we used to have empty seats on planes. Now, of course, they're going to start stapling us to the walls. So when this, you know, people would come up and they'd ask the question, they'd sit down, and then of course, then you had seven hours they could ask questions, and sometimes, you know, on a personal level it was a little taxing, but it was rewarding that you had people that wanted to know. And so what I told this person was, I said, you are the face of Christ today. You have to be the face of Christ. No one is going to go walk up and talk to a priest. Not after all the bad examples that some of the priests have given and certainly not by the media coverage. They're just not going to do it. And even if none of that was there, that's not the main reason. The main reason is because these young people and people in the world today have no clue. They wouldn't even know what question to ask. In 1989, at least someone had a basic understanding of Christianity that they could ask a question to clarify a point. 
It's why in working with you, you are the face of Christ. This is that mystic aspect that we foster a life of prayer and of frequenting this, the mysteries so that who Jesus is reveals himself and we live in the state of grace day after day. And so that at school or at work or even just shopping, the people that we meet, they can see at least something of a spark of who Christ is. And then when you meet who they are and they know who you are, then you say, you need to come and speak to Abuna. And you form that connection because now Abuna doesn't rip off heads and kill you. Because now they know because of you, you're the link now of the face of Christ and now they can ask the teacher. This is how this has got to work or it's not going to work at all. I know it's totally different from the way we've done it over the last 90 years here, but we need to shift it. And so our Lord is saying, you, everyone, and this is an apostle coming after his resurrection, because if you remember in the Gospels, he says, you don't go to the Samaritan towns, you don't go to the Gentiles, you only go to the lost sheep of Israel. It's what we thought about last week. So when he's talking about this throughout the nations, he's talking about after the resurrection. And this oneness, this transformation that takes place in us, what I just want to leave you with today is a consideration of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we've done our catechism 150 years ago. And we were probably given a list to memorize the seven gifts. And we memorized them and we spit them back for the teacher and we did whatever we had to do to get out of here. Because my mother is getting angry because she doesn't wait this long. They want to go to breakfast. And so we memorized them and that's it, we went on. If we can even remember any of the seven. But what I wanna leave you with today in this mystic Sunday, who is the one who is within us, is what are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? You know, the theologians and the fathers, they compare the life of virtue as we tra traverse the, the, the sea of life they <clears throat> compare the virtues, the life of virtues, to oars, rowing ourselves in this boat, you know? Not just bobbing along and fishing on occasion on the pond, but rowing from one side to the other. Your head's down, you're looking at the thing in front of you, you're watching the benches, and you're just rowing. And that's okay. <clears throat> and you have to get there anyway. If you don't row, you're not going to go there. You don't, love the you don't live the life of virtues within Christ, you're not going to make it to the kingdom. But what is given to us is that in the beginning of our spiritual life, it's mostly us working, rowing. We collaborate with God's grace, but it's mostly something I need, I need to remember. I have to get up in the morning and do some morning prayers. I need to figure out the discipline for some evening prayers. I need to say my rosary. I try to develop a life of discipline and order, which is my personal schedule. I'm rowing, and I'm staring at the bench, and I'm kind of just going along trying to do these things. And again, if I don't do them, because I don't like the structure, well, then you don't go anywhere. But as we move along and as we form that basic receptivity to God's grace within us, there's a moment when it becomes even more clearly God's work in collaboration with us. And it's from that moment when the gifts of the Holy Spirit begin to open. And so we use the image of rowing because the theologians and the fathers, they say what the Spirit is present within us, this divinity, a different who. God is present as much in you as he is in this pew. God is present as much in me as he is on the floor of this building as creator. But as who he is revealing himself, that's a totally different presence. Same God, different presence. The lady who lived down the street from you, four houses, is the same being who you now know and like as the lady who is chairing the PTA. And so what God is doing within us is a distinct presence, that spirit of God, and it's the unfurling of what they call the sails. And living under the inspirations of God, now all of a sudden God begins to lead us. And this is what we call the mysticism. It doesn't mean you levitate, it doesn't mean you radiate light, it means that you have a life which is docile and disposed to the inspirations of God. And that juncture, 
When all of a sudden now the sails are unfurled and the boat really starts to move now because the winds of the Spirit take us along, now all of a sudden you don't have to keep rowing in this kind of sweaty, futile, or at least hard movement, staring only at the bottom of the boat as you keep rowing. Now as the boat moves, you can look around you. You can see. And it moves us along so that we move in the unveiling of these seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. They move us so that, that what is primarily working is no longer just me doing all of my discipline and my asceticism, but now this coordination, it comes to a point in our lives where it is God mostly working. And we are responding to those inspirations. But it takes a long time to get there because we have to be listening. And that's hard. That's why if I'm just marching on Mount Katahdin today, it's because I haven't heard that the person down the street actually wants to reveal himself to me. And I'm not listening. And because I'm not listening, I never learn that love. And I never enter into that mystery. And I never enter under those inspirations of God. So just to understand that we pray for these gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is why if you look at the gospel again, our Lord says, look, when they arrest you, don't worry. You'll be given what to say. But you'll notice in the gospel a little bit later, he says, because it will not be you speaking. It will be the spirit of your Father speaking in you. Those are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean we go off into an airy fairy land where I just simply zone out and somehow everything becomes mystical. No. It's a life which is grounded to be able to hear the voice of God. And I leave you with the final example, the reason why we even wanted to discuss this today. In Columbia Magazine, which is the Knights of the Columbus, on the front page of the magazine there's a painting of a young man, a boy, 18, who graduated, should have graduated from high school last May. And of course, now, after 20 years after Columbine, we just keep hearing about school shootings all the time. It's part of this collapse societally that we have no structure. And so now we have our children shooting our other children. We really have major issues to deal with here. But last May, outside of Denver, there was another school shooting. But one of, there were two shooters and they were students. But in one of the classrooms, <clears throat> nobody was injured. Well, there was one. Because when this very disturbed person came walking in with a gun after lunch, one of the students immediately bolted up and rushed him and slammed him up against the wall and disarmed him. But in doing so, this boy was also shot and he died. So the Knights of Columbus put this young man in their magazine because, first of all, this was a very fervent Catholic. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the gift of counsel, where the Spirit gives us the inspiration in concrete circumstances what to say, what to do, how to act. And it's primarily God's work. It's not ours. Because uh, quite honestly, if the boy had actually stopped to be thinking about this in a rational manner as we talk about, he was graduating three days from that moment. Who would do that? But since we know from what the testimony of his parents and everybody who knew this 18-year-old was, this was a very good Catholic young man. And his desire was now that he was 18, he was going to become a Knight of Columbus and sign up now that he was in majority which is why the article in the paper. But clearly in this instance, because of this boy clearly prayed and was clearly merciful, and that's a whole other point that we're not talking about today, is the inspirations of God move us to being merciful because God is merciful. But mercy does not mean a dishrag. You don't condone what is evil. And this boy didn't condone what was evil that day. He immediately just lunged at this kid put him up against the wall, disarmed him, but in doing so was shot. And so three days later at graduation, you have an empty chair and they put everything there. They put his gown, they put his cap, they put a picture of him and testimony from the other students. 
But of course, now his memory lives eternal. I'm not saying you need to do that. But when it happens, it is a magnificent thing to see that kind of heroism. Because the Lord Jesus himself said, there is no greater love that can be shown but that a man lay down his life for his friends. So we've given you a lot of abstract doctrine. We give you one concrete application to see this. But that our prayer life then is to open Sunday after Sunday, morning after morning in our prayers, Sunday after Sunday before the divine mysteries, we ask, unfurl the sails in my life and transform me and take me where I have no idea it's going to lead me, but I know that it will be good. I know that it will be merciful. And what I leave you with is verse 26, which you don't have in the bulletins. And I don't know why it's not there. Because after all, our Lord says, you know, it's your, the spirit of your father that will be speaking in you. When he finishes the conclusion of all this, after telling us all these horrible things, children will kill their parents, parents will kill their children, brother will kill brother. He says, but the one who speaks within you, the spirit of your father, and speaking of this identity, if you look at the last verse of 25, he says, it is enough that the disciple be like his rabbi, that you learn from the teacher and, and imitate the teacher. It is enough that the slave imitate his master. And he finishes the gospel by saying that. If they've hated the master of the house and called him demonic, Beelzebul, what are they going to do with the members of the house? Of course this is going to happen to you. But it is enough to be like your master. And in verse 26, which is the part that's cut off, he finishes by saying, therefore, do not be afraid. We are one. And they may kill you. You may be shot at 18. But you also know that if you are one with me now in this persecution, you will be one with me in the resurrection. And that is a beautiful vision of the Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Itelvot madeb heida locho, valvot alocho dan fare kanyu. Weinu tsuvot aivoto, heyu del baito pesku del hayeko, hodko. Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As you remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merciful and holy Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared the spiritual banquet for us. 
Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. peace and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever Amen. O Lord we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies that we may raise glory to thanks to you now and forever of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you my brothers and sisters forever and with your spirit let us lift up our thoughts our minds and our hearts we lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility it is right and just Truly it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing with your voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify and proclaim. full of mercy. Holy is your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and holy is your life-giving Spirit. You are holy and the giver of all that is good. For our salvation, your only begotten Son became flesh of the pure Virgin Mary, and by his divine plan he saved and redeemed us. Fahuru 
dila dakhlo fai kun wa khlaf sagiye mai taqseo mati hab khulsoyon khawme wa hayin al qalam alamin قنا الكوسو دم سيخ ومن حمرا ومن مايو دار خوقاد يا بل تلمي دا كارو مارا صاب شتاو مهني كل خو خو نو دني تا Demandilen dia di ki khdato dakhlo faiku wa khlaf sagiye mete shadu meti hab khosoyo haume wa haye dan alam alami Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do so in memory of me until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O oh Lord, lover of all people, we remember your plan of salvation, and we ask you to have mercy on your worshippers and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time, to reward all people justly according to their deeds. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, O oh Lord, as we are sinful children, receive your graces. We thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O oh God, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin morio, anin morio, anin morio, nite modro chayu kadisho, unachen alainu al korbono hono. By his descent he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. We raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We offer you, O oh Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, the Shara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith, with blameless lives and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings, Forgive them so they may always live blameless lives in your presence 
and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them. For you are good and rich in graces, we pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, your holy church that you established on the solid rock of the true faith and send her vocations to the holy priesthood and religious life. In a world of distractions which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor, may those whom you have called to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Jude, St. Joseph, St. Tecla. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord mercy. Remember, O oh Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest, hoping in you, awaiting that life-giving voice calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf, and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Pleasing oblation, who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice, who offered yourself for us. You are the high priest, who offered yourself as the lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. Compassionate Lord, may we, your lowly servants, be made worthy to pray with holiness, with purity and holiness, and to call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but to deliver us from the evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways. And do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us. For yours is the kingdom with your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and holiness, that through them we may be forgiven and made holy, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity and sanctity one, one holy, holy father, father one holy son one holy spirit blessed be the name of the lord for he is one in heaven and on earth to him be glory forever make us worthy o lord god so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body and our souls purified by your forgiving blood May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for the life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Again and again, we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name, and that of your only Son, and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. And to his honor, this young man that I didn't give you, I realize I didn't give you his name. His name is Kendrick Castillo, out in Denver. So may his memory be eternal. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
One God, to whom be glory forever.